in the book of Genesis. And he said that in verse in chapter number 3, he said that a serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of, every, or eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of the both were opened. And they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Abel, or to Adam, excuse me, and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden and was afraid. Because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt uh, thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. And it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Father, I pray that you would help us today. Amen. Help us to look unto thee, to honor thee, learn more of thee, and draw closer to thee. For thou art God, and beside thee there is none else. Lord, we need you. More than we need anything else, we need you. Help us today for Jesus' glory and honor. Amen. I want to preach on this thought. A message for a maniac. Or the failure of a fiend. And uh, you will find that God is the preacher in this message. You'll find the pew sitters in this message. You will find the serpent. And you will find two sinners. You'll find Adam there, and you'll find a woman named Eve. They are sitting in the pews. God is preaching a message. He preaches three parts to this message that he preaches overall, but we'll only deal with the first part, the message to the maniac, the one who is a fiend who uh, has gone out to destroy what God delighted in has gone out to make a mockery of the Word of God and the will of God. The one who we know as the serpent, as Satan, and as sin. So I find the three people there, or three persons. Then I find, so we find the preacher, we find the few sitters, and we find the principles that are taught in this. I would say there's the verifiable facts that are taught. And then we say, not only do I find the verifiable facts, but we'll find a virgin's faith that is taught in this scripture. And then I will find a victorious fight found in the scripture that we're going to look at. Because we're going to look at verse number 14 and 15 of this chapter. And it says, The Lord God said unto the serpent, 
Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. I look first of all to see that the preacher is God himself. None other could preach this message with the authority that is preached other than God himself. For the word of God has not been written yet, and our whole authority is founded on the word of God. But when God speaks, he speaks with authority. I find this message is a very pointed message. God is not one who throws out a general message, but a very pointed message. The day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. That was pretty pointed. God preaches a pointed message. Me say, oh, you need to not be so pointed about what you're saying. You need to be more general about things. Don't call sin, sin, but just tell them that sin is the problem. And can I tell you, sin is the problem. But can I tell you, fornication, sin. Eating of the fruit God tells you not to eat of is sin. I just want to tell you, disobedience to God is sin no matter what it is. And so God is a very pointed preacher. He does not. He deals, number one, He'll deal with the serpent. Then you'll find out that He dealt with the woman. And then you'll find out that He dealt with Adam himself. So you find that he said, I'm not just preaching a message to the maniac, but I will preach a message to the man. Amen. And to mankind. He, so he deals with everything he said was directed toward somebody. I remember one day that somebody told me at a business meeting, he said, when you preached this morning, he was very upset with me. He said, when you preached this morning, he said, you were preaching right at me. And the first thought that crossed my mind was, who do you think I was preaching to? The folks down at the Methodist church. You were here. Absolutely was I preaching to you. But him and his anger did not understand. That's what preaching is supposed to be. It's supposed to be very pointed. I was preaching about gossip. And I found out who the gossip was. And uh, guess what? Hey, they tell me, if you throw a rock into a pack of dogs, the one that yelps is the one that you hit. God preached a pointed message right toward the devil. Right toward the serpent. Right toward Satan himself. So we find there's three few sitters here. It's a small church. Small church meeting. There was only two people in the church and there was a somebody that slid in. Slithered in. <laughs> the serpent slithered. That slithered on in the door. Two members of the church. And one maniac who came to church. So there's three in a few. And all three of them needed the message. All three of them needed to hear all par parts of the message. Even though all parts of the message did not apply to all three of them at the same time. As far as in specifics. So we will find the principles that are preached. And this is where we're going to get to our message today. And our message should not be long. Though I say that often, and it normally is longer than I expected. But I will look at the verifiable facts that we can learn up to this point from the scriptures and from why this message is preached. And so let's verify some facts here that we can think about. From the Word of God. Listening. 
See, the wisdom of the Word is better than looking at the wonders of the world. That is a verifiable fact that we can find in this portion of Scripture. For God had said, Not to eat of the tree, for the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. The word of wisdom, the word of righteousness, and listening to the wisdom of the word is better than looking at the wonders of the world. And I will tell you this, that that is exactly where most of the time we find our problem. God has told us in the word of God, thou shalt not, and if thou dost, this will happen. Thou shalt not do this, and don't do this because there's consequences. And many times, instead of listening to the words of wisdom, and the wisdom of the word. We will look at the wonders of the world. We'll look at the well-watered plains of Jordan as Lot did. We will look and say, it looks good. There are riches to be gained. There's plenty of land. There's plenty of everything I want. It would only make sense for me to go into Egypt is what Abraham said or Abram said because I need food for my family. And yet as we learned in Sunday school, Abram went down there. When he came back, he came back with an agar who became a problem for his wife. His wife went to Egyptian solutions to solve her problem of being barren. And so she gave him her maid. And then we, her handmaid, then, then we find that Lot had seen what Egypt was like. And so he looked for things of Egypt. I say this, we ought to listen to the wisdom of the word. And quit looking to the wonders of the world. The world has a lot to offer. But it comes with a high price tag. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy uh, strength, with all thy mind. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. That's the first and great commandment. And the second was like it. God tells us what we should do. And then God tells us what we should not do. But many a times, we'll reason things out in our own mind. And we'll lean to our own understanding. Because we look and say it hasn't failed them. Oh, look at them. We'll, we'll, fret, we'll fret or because of the evildoers. And we'll look at those who are prosperous in the way. And we'll say, oh, look at this. We could have this. And they'll tell you. You can be as God. They'll not use those words, but you'll have all the riches you need. You won't need God. Because if you do it our way, you'll have health. You'll have wealth. You'll have all these things. And so, they get caught up in all the world's philosophies. And let me say, not all the time are they bad things. Tell me what was wrong with that for you. Was there a thing wrong with that fruit? Did God say that fruit is poison? Did God say that fruit has worms? Did God no? She looked at it, and it was good to look upon. It was beautiful. The appearance of it. And it, it's a tree to make one wise. They say it was an apple. Some people an apple a day keeps the doctor away. But you don't eat an apple if God tells you don't eat an apple. Right. Now I'm not saying it was an apple. I don't know if it was an apple. I don't know what it was. I personally think it was a watermelon. 
That watermelon used to grow on trees. Now God put them on the ground so a serpent can run around with them. And it's got a bunch of seeds in it. Amen. And he put a hard crust around it so that you can't get to it easily. you got a purpose to get to it. And that's, that's my take on this thing. Now y'all can take it or leave it. But I will tell you this, I like that thought. I don't like watermelon anyway, so it's easy for me. But we find the first verifiable, verifiable fact is that listening to the wisdom of the word is better than looking at the wonders of the world. And we find that in 3, 6. We find that in chapter 3, verse number 6, where God tells them, and when the woman saw the tree was good for food, that it was better to die than the tree for to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also her husband with her, and he did eat. I'll give you another one. Subtle friends can become slithering fiends. Subtle friends can become slithering fiends. We know that's a verifiable fact. Here he is, the serpent, the most subtle of all the creatures of the beast of the field. And here he is and becomes befriends Eve. He became a subtle friend. He said, I'm just going to come up there. I'm very unassuming. I look like I'm your buddy. Brother Barnes tells me the other day, he said, do not be surprised if when you go to the mayor that the mayor does not receive you as open arm as you're trying to present yourself. Because many a person will go to the mayor and those in authority bearing gifts only to try to manipulate to get what they want from them. And I said, that is so true. And I find this to be true here. That the subtle friend was a slithering fiend. He slithers away. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us that it'll be on the ground. He becomes that way. He's a maniac. He's a madman. He is crazy about doing anything he can do to destroy what God has created. And you will find that those who get so bent on destruction will do anything including destroy their own self so that they can get what they want. I can take that someplace, but I'm not going to this morning, but you can take that into our political realm today and uh, find that that is so true that subtle friends can become slithering fiends. See in verses 1 through 4, the serpent was most subtle. And uh, he talks to the woman and said, You shall not surely die, verse number 4. And in verse number 14, we find, And the Lord God said to the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou curse above all cattle, above all beasts of the field, upon thy belly shall thou die. That's a verifiable fact. And let me say, that can happen in our lives. Another verifiable fact that I found in this portion of Scripture is no one wants to die alone. You say, what are you talking about? Well, did she not take and give her husband with her? Did she not do that? Here's what it says. And she gave also to her husband with her and did eat and gave her husband with her. And he did eat. No one wants to die alone. You say, what are you talking about? The wages of sin is death. Everybody in sin wants to get somebody involved in some kind of sin. They want you to condone it. They want you to uh, be part of it. Say, I do not believe that to be the case. 
Tell me why people who are anti-God, anti-Bible, want you to condone their lifestyle. Want you to condone things that God has condemned. And they'll say, we're the bad guys because we say, that is wrong. And they'll say, oh no, we will take you to court to force you to make cakes, to force you to do this. They want you to partake of their sin so that you go down the same debauchery and despicable situation that they'll end up in. That you will end up in the same devil's hell that they end up in. Because they think they can destroy you. They don't better themselves. They try to bring you down. And I would say that's the same thing with everybody. They want you to accept them. So they'll say, a little bit won't hurt. Why don't you drink light beer? It doesn't have quite as much alcohol as the other. Hey, instead of going to the gambling hall, just play the lottery. And that money's going to go to education. They'll use anything to draw you into gambling. Let me say, they use good things sometimes to draw you into bad things. They wanted medical marijuana. And many a state embraced medical marijuana. The next thing that happened after they embraced medical marijuana is that crowd said, go into recreational marijuana. Why? It can be used for medicine. It certainly can, and it's nothing, and it's not harming people by using it for medicine. We're going to use it. For recreation, because it can't be that bad. It can't be that bad. Huh? No one wants to die alone. They want to drag you down with them. I would also tell you this that's a verifiable fact that God has taught us here. Covering sin does not cancel sin. They covered their sin. He that covered sin shall not prosper. But whoso confesses in faith forsaken them shall have mercy. In verse 7, and the eyes of them both were open, and they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the, cool of, in the garden in the cool of the day. Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden and was afraid because I got myself covered up with fig leaves. No, because I'm naked. And I hid myself. Because he knew that God could see through the fig leaves because all the fig leaves you use to cover your sin will not deal with your sin. Covering sin does not cancel sin. You and I need to learn that truth. Have you ever tried to cover something up and not bring it to God, not weep before God about it, but just say, I'm not going to let anybody know about it, not even going to let God know about it? Well, let me tell you this, God knows about it. You can't hide it from God. I can hide it from you. I can hide it from the world. But I cannot hide sin from God. Some will try to cover their sin by acting spiritual. They'll show up for church more. They'll study more. They'll memorize more scripture. They'll do all the right things to cover up a wrong thing. Let me say, it does not cancel sin.
sin. Another thing is that God will deal with sin. We cannot hide. We cannot handle the issue of sin no matter what we do deal with our sin. Once it's committed, God must confront it. God would be a liar if he did not deal with it. He said the day I was there of, thou shalt surely die. God had no other option. The wages of sin is death. God had no other option but to deal with sin. There is nothing else he could do. If he let sin go, and I know he went at it for a season according to the book of Acts. But he did not wink at it in the sense of forgetting about it. He just put it off down the road till the time of Christ. And when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made the woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law. God has to deal with sin. Changing our prayer life, changing our practices, nothing and anything else can change the fact of our sin. There's those that will tell you, say so many Hail Marys, go help somebody across the street, read through your Bible, all those things saying, we will deal with sin. This is how to deal with sin. Just like you cannot cover your sin and cancel it. God has to be the one that tells you what to do about your sin. God has to be the one. It takes the shedding of blood of the Lord Jesus Christ to deal with sin. And God did just that. You cannot deal with it. God must deal with it. All your religious ritualism will not deal with sin. Many have tried it. And let me say this one more thing here. I will tell you there's some more, but God deals with the condemnation of sin prior to dealing with the consequences of sin. He deals, these are verifiable facts. We find it right here in this portion of Scripture. He tells them. Because that he deals with this thing, this, this condemnation of sin, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and the beasts of the field upon thy belly shall thou go, and dust thou shalt eat all the days of life, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. When this maniac came in, when this subtle friend slithered in as a fiend, as he comes in to this church service, and he's there, and he's listening. God said, I want to deal with the sin. I want to deal with the serpent. I want to deal with Satan before I deal with the consequences, the condemnation of it. You'll find that he dealt with that before he tells her that she'll be in sorrow bearing children. Before that, you'll find that the, the soil will not bring forth like it should but that there will be uh, thorns and thistles. He dealt with the condemnation of the sin before he dealt with them about the consequences of their sin. Sin must be condemned. And God does that. He shows us the constant frustration towards sin. I will put enmity between thee and the woman. Let me say, your sin will cause a constant frustration to you. It will find you out. You can't seem to get away from it. Do you ever find that to be the case? You find yourself in some sin You've allowed some sin in your life and no matter what you try to do, that sin keeps being brought up to your mind. You can't.